Good evening, friends. Um, I'm really honored to have the opportunity for the fireside chat with Sri Vallabhai Bansali, a respected and renowned leader known for doing right things when, when, even if, uh, when it is hard. I am even more related to discuss with him on value-based leadership driving value creation. A topic not only close to Vallabha and me, but also the need of the hour in today's fast-paced and volatile environment. IDMA is an association of companies mostly run by seasoned and successful entrepreneurs, based uh, which is poised to grow their companies multifold in coming 25 years of Amrit Kal for India and Pharma. The big leveler of our times is knowledge and information, now available seamless and equally to all. The big and the only differentiator will remain in the coming time is the people we work with and by extension the value-based leadership we offer to them. Value-based leadership is about more than just financial returns and metrics. It's about doing business in a way that's honest, fair, and good for everyone involved. In today's world, where trust in leaders is crucial, this kind of leadership is more important than ever. The multitude of very accomplished entrepreneurs sitting in the August gathering are building companies that will most likely outlast our lifetimes. The focus for most, if not all, is on building companies in the right way with ethics, principles, and sustainability at the core. We are very lucky to have Sri Vallabhai Bansali with us, who will, through his life examples, show us why is this is the only way to build an enduring company and create value along the way for everyone involved. So get started, and let me welcome and introduce Sri Vallabhai Bansali form, uh, formally. Vallabhai Bansali, a dedicated Vipassana meditator and for three decades and attributes much of his success to Vipassana. Formerly the chairman of Global Vipassana Foundation, he is a renowned thought leader, mentor and visionary investor in India, co-founder of Inam Securities, a respected investment banking and group. Vallabhai merged its advisory business with Axis Bank in 2010. Thereafter, focusing on social, national, and spiritual endeavors. Devoting himself to various causes, he founded Desh Apnaya Foundation, impacting students and teachers in government schools across four states by instilling active citizenship values at a young age. Vallabha initiated Truth Talks, emphasizing the practical benefits of truthful life. As a founding member of the Government Board of Flame, India's pioneer liberal education university and the Indian School of Public Policy, he actively contributes to education and policy. Engaged as a trustee of BJS and NGO, Ballabhai has played a key role in the value education and large-scale water restoration efforts. Beyond his philanthropic work, he has hosted a popular TV show on volunteerism and co-produced documentaries capturing India's civilization and yoga system. Serving on the board of Reserve Bank of India and various policy advisory committees, Vallabha has received accolades including admission to the Hall of Fame of Institute of Chartered, Account Chartered Accountants and two honorary doctorates. So please welcome uh, Shri Vallabhai Vansali. We are very, very fortunate to have him with us. My first question to you, Vallabhai. First of all, it's extremely um, challenging and difficult to look in his eyes and ask him questions. I have so much of regard, love and trust for him. What growth qualities or features should Bharat pursue in the next decade? 
So at the outset, um, uh, it's a great honor to be here today amongst industry leaders and so many of the people sitting here who have looked up to for many, many years. And I'm here not for any of the long stuff that he read, but simply because he can't look me in the eye and I can't say no to you. And <laughs> I just don't feel qualified to be talking to pharma industry. I know so little about it. Um, but we can talk about India and some of the other stuff. So we have had good momentum. And uh, there are a lot of good things that are happening. And this is primarily because I think the only real asset of a country is its people. We are uniquely cultured, ancient cultured people, and culture which had the base of very scientific spirituality. And therefore, a lot of our practices and beliefs are founded in natural principles. Unfortunately, we have lost a lot of them. So I won't delve too much into it, but coming to your point, we should not count on this momentum taking us to where a lot of people are projecting. It does not happen. So we have a lot of case studies in the world of you know, how far demographics and some of these early stage changes will take and no farther. But anyway, so there are uh, three or four things I think we need to do besides whatever is happening. Number one, understand the value of freedom, right? Our economic freedom started in 91 when we were, let, we were allowed to pursue our dreams to a greater extent. The freedoms are not complete even today. If I have the freedom and that freedom is blocked by an inadequate legal system, a broken regulatory system. You, a lot of you are in pharma and you know what I mean by regulatory system. So while you'll say, okay, the race begins and then there is a hurdle. And then you run further and there is a hurdle. And there is no referee, right? I mean, when you don't have an effective judicial system, a tribunal system, you don't have a referee, you don't have a redressal mechanism. And so on and so forth. So I've, let's not go deep into it. So we need many other reforms for the freedoms to become meaningful. Second is innovation. The world is led today by technology. There are many, many interesting stories of technology that how few countries have understood this, that the growth in 20th century and a lot more in 21st century is going to be driven primarily by technology. You had a session on AI, I believe, today morning, and that is just one example. And AI is just one part. I think what is happening on quantum computing, on chip design on bio, biomedical and so on and so forth is enormous. So we need massive innovation. And I have a question to ask of this gathering. Where is our pharma industry on innovation? Mehul said we have a lot of entrepreneurs who want to make a lot of money, etc. As a country, our rank on innovation is very, very low. I had an occasion to be associated with many industrial houses in this country including IT industry, several pharma companies at some point of time. And some of they have grown tremendously. IT industry is more than $200 billion of export today. But what is that track record of r and What is that earth-shaking thing which they have? We got to recognize that we are a labor arbitrage economy. Our value add is extremely low. We can say Apple is going to be 4 lakh crores exports out of India. But of that four lakh crores, what do you get? So I think if India has to grow further, this innovation has to be immense. Pharma industry, I mean, hundreds of people here, a lot of new companies come up, but what is our contribution? We had one vaccine, right? It made us very proud. But how many diseases have we tackled? How many sectors we have championed? So we are champion producers, manufacturers, but if you are an innovative industry and you have not innovated massively, uh, and as I said, my idea is not to belittle, I think we all feel extremely proud. Nimish and I were talking today morning and saying that, look, when we started our career, we had very few Indian pharma companies of significance, right? We had Ambala, Sarabhai, and a few of them. And today there are so many. MNCs have gone out. So that's fantastic. 
and there are a lot of good practices. But I think we need to go further. The last, the other feature that we need to have, and which is not really of great concern to you, but as a nation is very important, is that we think of jobs. We think of a large part of our population depending on agriculture to become more productive. And so he's skilling, et cetera, et cetera. The last, the most important point is that, you know, we are challenged by a China which is not to our northeast, but China which is all around you. It is in Sri Lanka, it is in Burma, it is in Beng coming in Bangladesh, Maldives, et cetera, et cetera. And China is the country to think about today. It is no more the U.S. And to give an example of China, in, 19, in 2015, in Obama's, you know, towards the end of his presidency, he just mentioned that, look, you know, Chinese have stolen our technology and we should block them. Trump, of course, become very strident about it, but how Chinese reacted. They started working on semiconductor, this, that, knowing that we will be stopped. Today, they are way ahead in robotics and so many fields they have not been able to stop. Now, to tackle a China, we will need a large budget. And that is very small. The GST at 170 doesn't work. That number has to grow. For which digitalization has to grow and so on and so forth. So I think this India momentum that we are counting on, we can't count on. There are stories that you can become a med club, a Mediterranean country with tourism, etc. Live at ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. You can become a Thailand. How many brands you know from Korea and how many from Thailand? Right? That's an example. So a lot has to be done. And the good thing is, India has the capability. We need the aspiration. We need much more aspiration from every sector, and personally, a lot more from pharma sector. We have a real chance besides IT and whatever to do wonders to the world through pharma. We had our own yoga, we had our own Ayurved, and we haven't paid attention to it. So how, why this is happening is, that the rule setting, the standard setting has been taken over by small countries, the small population. We are not relevant. But we are all, we, our administration has not grown enough, has not, not confident enough. I have invested in a, in a research company in the medical field and I know that, you know, what sort of people sit in Delhi and, you know, try and regulate. And we, we empathize with them. But who will change all of this? We have to collectively change all of this. So I can go on, but so that is the answer to, you know, we can't take India, we'll go on like this forever. We need many more change. Thank you, Vallabhbhai. Uh, after this uh, macro question, I'll get into the subject for today. Uh, do organizational values uh, emanate from individual values how do they progress to social, national levels? Net-net individu individuals start the value system. So there is no doubt about it. And say, for example, the whole concept of an avatar uh, is telling that, uh, we say, dharma sansthapanarthayam kambhavami yuge yuge. So they have to come again and again. So the Tirthankar, Buddha, Messenger, all of them seem to suggest this. You will have a Narayan Murthy, you will have a Nanji Reddy, you will have a J.R.D. Tata, you know, uh, uh, Jamshed Ji Tata. Who will be the... But practically speaking, it is the organization that adopt, shape, proliferate, establish, perpetuate those values. So I think there's a great role for both. And unless you convert values, which are a set, is a part of a complete set. And that complete set is purpose, culture, and value. May not be in that order, maybe purpose, values, and then a culture. And then you will have vision, strategy, etc., etc., on the other side. So how it is said that culture will eat strategy for lunch. Right? This culture is so much more powerful. So while Values will come from individuals who have that extra energy, that extra clarity, vision, etc. But it will be the organization design and its ability to proliferate them that will make a difference. So you need role for both of them. How it grows to the society is, Vriddhi is a fine example of it. The history of mankind is that either the good collaborate 
or they become complacent. Whenever they have collaborated, they have made a big difference. So I hope that the good in us, and we all have good in us, how do we collaborate instead of becoming egoistic, suspicious of others, etc.? That will be a game change. Um, how can uh, see, we pharma companies, we are all mostly entrepreneurs driven. And uh, we are all driven by number of leaders within the organization. So how can leaders actualize and communicate values to stakeholders? Actualize is, is a very powerful word. And let me give you a simple, uh, something cultural from our, our life. A rich man is called Sate, right? But have you thought about where did the word Sate come from? Anybody? Sate comes from the Sanskrit word Shrisht. So if you, you know, look at Ramayana, or that time where they have more Sanskritized Hindi, a Sate will be referred to as ki, is nagar ka bada shrishti tha. So there's a big difference between a rich man and a shrisht man. And why is it? Look at the, I'll give you some more examples, right? A seat, that category of person was also called a sahukar, right? a mahajan, mahajan, right? And it goes across our languages. In south, it became chettiyar. Shrishti seat became chettiyar. It's the same underlying reality. And why is this person called shrisht? Very, very, very interesting. Because a businessman does not have a closed balance sheet ever, actually speaking, right? If you did brilliantly for one year, but you had no visibility about the next year, you don't feel good about it at all. So automatically, how you go from one year to the next, and next to the next, and therefore that perpetuity starts again. Number one. Number two, how, when do you make a profit? When does a businessman make a profit? After he has paid everybody. Right? He has to pay for raw material, the rent, he has to pay interest, he has to pay salaries, he has to pay the government. After paying everybody, this man is feeding the whole system. And not only feeding the system, but he must relate properly to all of them, that the employee must want to come to work for him, more employees must come, etc., etc. Therefore, to be a rich man by doing certain things, by being entrepreneurial is one thing. To be a shrisht is quite another. It is when you start recognizing your role that if I, my business has to become shrished, I have to become shrished. And therefore, your references change from just your business or your sector to your unit, from your unit to a wider set of references, society, community, etc., etc. So I can, it's a very interesting topic and very powerful as a matter, very inspiring to think uh, of. And uh, so maybe I'll give you a Tata story. I won't tell you the year, but this is about Empress Mill. And a crash is established in that Empress Mill because there are a lot of women workers. And so they say, no, no, your children will be looked after. If their children are older, they will have education classes. Oh, you want to study, we will have evening classes for you workers, etc. And people say, wow, what a man this, that, etc. And Mr. Tata says, Oh, I'm not doing it out of philanthropy. I don't think I'm any the less unselfish by doing all of this. I have no such qualms about it. I do it because I think it's very important to see the benefit of the community with which I deal with. No wonder Tata's are what. And you know what year was it? It was the 19th century. We can't even, even today we can't conceive of these things. And that's why a Tata is a Tata. So, How can organizational values stay relevant amidst of changing environments? So if I, this may be related to your second question, but the first question had another part of communicating. And maybe I should use another Tata story. So we, how do we communicate? 
So you say thousand words are equal to a picture. A demonstration of value is equal to ten thousand such things. How do you demonstrate? So Mrs. Murthy Sudha Murthy narrates this story. Some of you may have heard it. That we know the story. She wrote a postcard. You are biased against women. This, that, etc. She eventually gets a job. She was at Bombay House in you know, Fountain area of Bombay, and she was waiting for Narayan Murthy to come and pick her up. So she was going down the steps, and uh, most people had left office, and there was this old gentleman walking along, and he said that this girl is going, and is quite rather quiet. Bombay wasn't that busy that time. So he says, "Okay, I will walk with her." And then she goes and stands outside, and then she, he is watching, and he goes and stands with her. And she said, "Oh, who are you waiting for? My husband to come? This, that, etc." She has no idea who she had written to that this was G R D Tat. His concern for this woman, we have no idea. This is the same Sudha Murthy, but just one of my employees standing alone in a rather lonely place. I want to be with her. That is the. You don't have to tell employees matter for us. And when you demonstrate that, what happens? Harvard writes a story on how Taj employees gave their life. You don't have to teach them that you know customer is important for you. If you have time, I'll tell you one more story. Why does that employee feel so empowered? There are many stories about you know from Mulgaonkar and this that etc. But one story which is very interesting, which I heard at Flame. There was an occasion in Titan, right? We all know the great story of Titan, and there was an occasion where they wanted to create some short-term impact, and they say maybe you know we have to retrench people. It was very hard for them to decide, but they said well, this is the only way we can do. We have some surplus people, so they said okay, we have about eight hundred people. We need to let two hundred people go. How will we do it? So they consulted this, that, etc., and then they said two lakh rupees is good enough to give them. Somebody said three lakh. So union leader, consultant, everybody said three lakhs. The management was not happy with it. So something restless. We invited these people. We went to their families and got these girls. How can we ask them to go? So he just went around the room. He said, "In look, what is in mind? What is it? This is your consultant, union leader, all have gone." इनके मन में क्या है Somebody से साहब इनके मन में तो सात आठ लाख रुपया था तीन लाख मानेंगे बहुत खुश होंगे पर इनके मन में सात आठ लाख था He said, ठीक है Next morning, they made an offer of एट lakhs rupees to anyone to go. There was a queue. He said, now because there is competition to go, there is no burden on my heart. And that employee didn't have to ask anybody at that time. Employee didn't feel because ये तो टाटा का पैसा है मेरा अब क्या जाता है मैं तो बुरा देता हूँ. No, those are the employees. That is Mr. Bhaskar, but who succeeded, succeeds this. I and we know what all he did. It is because of such empowerment which you demonstrate that Tatas are today with very few family members. And today you have a non-family member running the largest empire of our country and making us all proud. So I think you have to demonstrate values. very very powerful story i'm sure to all of us so uh, again coming back to my same question uh, in today's uh, you can say changing environment vuka world how do you how the organization values uh, stay relevant you feel we have to keep relooking at it every few years so the emphasis can change right sometimes productivity is important sometimes market share is important sometimes quality is important but the overall values cannot change all have to be important and what will create this stability is an abiding purpose if you are there for you know money making the reference that you have see the trouble is if you are running a business by yourself or with your family you don't need any of but the reality is we want to become bigger we have people who don't know you and it has to percolate down the line and it imagine a state bank of india that employee would have like sudham murthy would never have met jrd tata and how do you still motivate sudham and that when you have a narrow goal of money making for yourself others will they will say whatever to your face they are not that motivated they don't connect to you but when you have a wider purpose 
everybody will connect to you. And let me tell you a story. This is about Infosys. Soon after the, we did the ADR in 19, 1999, and they became the first company to list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were doing very well. There were two years when they grew 100% year on year. And they made a lot of smaller companies in the US nervous. So the benchmark company when we took them to public uh, in uh, America was a company, I won't name it, it's not good. That was considered the best company in that category. That company came up for acquisition because they could not sustain competition. So Infosys was to acquire the benchmark company now in two years of listing. So everything was settled. And then they said where the headquarters will be of this merged company. So they said, no, it has to be California. And everyone agreed it has to be California. Mr. Narayan Murthy put his foot down. He said, if it is California, we'll become an American company. We started with the dream of making a great Indian company. We can't sacrifice. They dropped the deal. That company went out of business after three years, which is a different matter, which is not what he wished, which is what he could not accomplish. But it was so clear in his mind that we have to be an Indian company. So that purpose, when you demonstrate that this purpose means to you and you're ready to sacrifice it, it will percolate down to your employees, to your customers. If I can give you another example. At NM, we had this practice of you know, not participating in anything that was anti-society, anti-life, anything that killed life, we never participated, liquor, gambling, etc., etc. It was a value important to us, so we practiced. It didn't matter. Many years later, a journalist came to me and said that, do you know your employees are so proud of you? I said, now, naya kya hai? <laughs> he said, they know they don't have to do anything, Garbar, because you're not after money. If you were after money, you would say, bring every deal. You have to let go deal so easily. So they are they're so comfortable, and you can be comfortable that they never do anything wrong. So these benefits of standing by your purpose and your values brings you enormous rewards that you cannot see. Very, very powerful statement. I think irrespective of, based on your various examples, uh, you feel irrespective of your size, scale, competition, humility and empathy has to be part of your value system, whether it is return or unwritten. Just as I said that there's a difference between a paisawala seat and a shrisht. So also, when you start seeing, you say, where did I come from? Did I design my birth, its time, my gender, my family? If you ponder really, if you are conceited and egoistic, you will miss many things. You're not even worth counting. But if you think that you should matter, you have to see yourself in the universe. And when you start seeing that, then you say, oh, there seems to be a bigger plan and I'm a small cog in it. And then what happens? Let me tell you another great, you know, a statement by a man who we all love and respect, Warren Buffett. So whenever they talk about his greatness and all, he says, look, look, I have no such uh, misgivings about myself. I simply won the ovarian lottery. That I was born to the right set of parents in the right country at the right time. Because I am an idiot. I know only one thing stock picking. I don't know anything else. <laughs> and that stock picking in the post-World War period was a very, very profitable. That you know, his father had encouraged him to you know, start becoming a businessman investor from a young age. And he said, only thing that I really knew, my mathematical number skills, etc., and then my ability to pick a partner like Charlie Munger. I don't know any of you know that Mr. Charlie Munger was not an investor by background. He was a lawyer. Investment was his something on the side. He had great investment thinking. Now we all know that probably far superior to Mr. Warren Buffett's or was a great compliment, should I say, synergistic with him. So I think once you recognize this ovarian theory, you know, your recognition of this, there is a wisdom from our scriptures. And once Mahatma Gandhi said that if this world were to come to an end and everything was destroyed, but if this one shloka survived, 
I think the most valuable part of our civilization would have survived. Anybody can guess what the shloka is? A lot of you know that shloka. It's from one of our Upanishads. If I say it, maybe you will recognize it. Isha vasya midam sarvam yat kimcha jagatyam jagat tenat yaktein bhunjitaha magrida kasya sviddhanam It says that, oh, everything that you see around you moving, in, not moving, animate, inanimate, is controlled by an order. Ish, Ishwar is something, is a controlling order. It's not referring to an individual. And if you are controlled by an order, what is your freedom? Nothing? No. He says the way to deal with it is have this attitude of tena tyaktena bhunjitaha that consume, partake, like a child in a family, you know, everything is yours, you enjoy everything, but don't start owning it. Oh, it is my toy, I won't give you my brother, that doesn't work. Then it says, Magrida kasya svit dhanam. He says, if you don't behave in this manner, you will get punished. You are a thief. I think once this recognition comes, that some order has placed you in a position, and I'll go back to that innovation question, that as an industry, we have done well. There are people who make thousands of crores. How many of us have taken a bet like Tata's? Can I tell you one more story? This is 1902. Mr. Jamshedji Tata is already 63 years old. He had this dream that I must build a steel plant in India. And that he was so serious, the story went around that, you know, he's looking for building a steel plant in India, he's going, you know, many places to find a consultant, etc., etc. There was Sir Upcott. Upcott was the railway commissioner of India. And he heard about it that Tata Steel, you know, Tata want to make steel and he will make rails because railway was growing at that point of time. And he'll make rails. You know how the British can be arrogant. He said, what? Tata making rails? I will eat every pound of it. This is the kind of disdain that he was facing. This man went around. By and by, he found the man who could be the best consultant for him. He was the best consultant in US. US was growing big into steel in the turn of the century. He went to him, and that man writes. He said, this strangely dressed person, he was dressed in his Parsi attire, came into my room and said, are you Perrin? I'm Tata. And he paused. He looked into my eyes. I heard about you. A such a such person has sent me to you. You will build my steel plant. You are the best consultant. You will come to India with me. And he paused. Perrin was frozen. Such was the magnetism, such was his love for his country that Perrin could not say no. Perrin came to India, he built. Jamshedji died in 1905. He didn't see. But 1912, then the plant started opening and etc. So I think at no point of time, Tatas, they really thought that, you know, they were doing it. They were, they were, so, you know, this humility, if we see around that the greatest people who have become shreshed, they are always humble. They recognize that, you know, so many things have happened. It's a matter of confluence of things that, you know, you have got rich. So when we start looking beyond this gratitude, humility come, and what rewards you will get in your business, what rewards you will get in life, you, your reputation will work a lot more than all your strategies and all your capital can work. Okay. <laughs> What, le uh, what should leaders focus on? What is good for the customer is good for the business? Or what is good for society is good for business? They cannot be different, right? So, a few years back, right, we had a problem with Cadbury packing. You know what happened? Immediately sales went down. So, what was not good for customer clearly was not good for the... Or Maggie, you had an accident and then immediately... you. So trust and culture are the only two things 
that a wise businessman will be. And if you lose trust, you lost everything. Mr. Mangar talked a lot about this trust, you know, the circle of unbroken chain of deserved trust, he used to talk about. He says, called it a Lollapalooza. It's an unbeatable competition. I mean, unbeatable, unbeatable uh, competitive advantage comes from this. So, culture is the only thing that, you know, if you read Peter Drucker or C.K. Prahlad or any of the great gurus, they say, the culture is the only thing you build. So, when you stop thinking of the consumer, you might as well stop thinking of your business. So, take a topi, right? So, if I say, I make caps, right? At one point of time, 50. I, this is a very fascinating you know, thing that happened in my own life, that everyone used to wear a cap or something on my, you know, my father used to wear one and all. Now, if I'm a cap guy and I think, oh, everyone has to wear a cap, it doesn't work. So, I have to see my consumer, my customer, his, her good, is the only way a business can survive. And it is, if you see what actually happens, right? Seasons change. In one day, nature changes so much. Is prompting, everything is prompting you to be sensitive to change. If something is changing, something is not changing. So, customer is bound to change because once we have one level of satisfaction, we go to another level of satisfaction. I, you get you. So, you know how the Japanese started saying quality is given. India is now coming to a situation where we say quality is given. And if you don't have it, I'll tell you two stories in this. How this trust matter, it may not be exactly customer, but it's the same thing because, you know, who is your customer? Who is your customer? Isn't your supplier your customer? Isn't your employee your customer? Isn't your regulator your customer? Actually, you think about it, they are all your customer, right? They trust you in certain manner. There was a story of C. Dot, Microsoft around 1999, they had this occasion that they will widen the use of Indian companies and other consultants. And so they said, how do I choose a partner? So quietly they did an audit. That now maybe people are not, but maybe people are still doing, that you buy illegal software, pirated software. So in, they did a survey of Indian companies and they found Infosys had bought every license. They did not steal a single license. And so they selected. Now once they selected, so the, I won't mention names, but the bigger companies, they were livid. This is such a big opportunity and Microsoft is choosing only Infosys in India. How can that happen? Then whatever happened. Take the reverse case. It may be... I, it is just for education purpose that I'm mentioning these names, and I don't want to disparage anybody, but you know, a few years back, Ren Bixi happened. What happened? If you don't think of regulator, you don't think of others as being your customer, you do these things as acceptable and you pay a huge price for it. The whole industry paid a price for that. So there's only one good, your customer's good. Thank you. Um. Most of the IDMA entrepreneurs are first generation entrepreneurs and now a lot of youngsters are there. Second generation is coming in. So uh, today Dilip Bhai met a lot of second generation entrepreneurs now. So one question is, uh, what can leaders do to have a seamless transition of leadership, avoid stagnation and foster continual growth beyond their tenure and ensure uh, the, uh, the values are sustained. So values can go beyond. And as I said, values have to have certain amount of dynamism. So this belief that what I believe, what I know, that I'm the repository of all knowledge is completely bunk. Second, you go back any time in history. The current generation is always suspicious of the next generation. You know, what will these kids do? They don't know anything. Look at them, you know, look at the way they dress, blah, 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 etc. You want to scoff at them. You know, you are the same generation and you, know, you proved yourself. They will also prove themselves. So if you empower them, rather than try and see your carbon copy in them, I think this will happen. We need new creativity with new situations. You make them capable, you may give them confidence, then they will be creative. You, you, 
teach them value system and value system is you know if you have created a lot of no's and yeses right if you created only no's the guy has lost confidence he doesn't want to come into your business or comes reluctantly you have created only yeses this guy is spoiled he's no good in any case so only way to think about this succession is you create competence have uh, you know confidence and then you leave it to destiny so i think uh, it is happening brilliantly i have full confidence in the next generation great for the paucity of time last question and then we'll open for one or two questions from the uh, crowd here how to cult cultivate gratitude and recognition of importance of family and relationships in corporate success so i think those who start thinking of themselves uh, beyond the narrow reference these things happen that when somebody comes to work uh, it's actually it's not that just person right it is the backing of his wife or husband or family his whole tradition sometimes his communal pride all of that is coming to work to your place you better be conscious of it and it's a great mistake not to do it and i'll tell you a story from one of the most successful companies of our time dmart dmart is such a non descript company but doing fantastic things because they understand all what i talked about shreshth culture this that etc and a demonstration of that when the company opened its 300th store they did a function normally they are not a celebrating they celebrate within themselves but they call their family friends etc and it was not some great artist singing or some great what was the event they identified 15 of the people who they thought had made the biggest difference they were not necessarily sales somebody was logistics somebody was into you know finding places etc etc all 15 people he brought all the 15 people he brought their wives on the stage and he asked each manager to go down on his knee and thank his wife or husband in one or two cases this is the recognition that these people are far more important to me so when you start going on a particular directions these things happen any message to all of us in this current space of vriddhi what we are all here i would say that aspiration let your aspiration rise there is no use talking about ram and buddha and mahavir and all our great culture and this that etc and then to think like poppers to think like nobodies to think like you know some arbitrage we will do of labor or chemical or regulatory by arbitrage and make profit and be better than my cousin be better than my neighbor etc no we have to think of ourselves as world beaters if we had the chemistry of this country we have knowledge systems of our own whether it is ayurveda the yoga or other systems etc there nobody else as it is you know my daughter practices in america as an ayurvedic expert she went to an ayurvedic school in america so i think our industry has to have very serious aspiration of making an impact rather than just growing or you know having riches that's my message just for 5 minutes uh, we'll have some q and a one or two questions anybody wants to ask vallabhai sure please hero bhai very very happy to hear you vallabhai thank you only one question what motivates you vallabhai after creating so much of wealth after creating you know so much of big universities and giving so well to the society now what motivates you <laughs> because i don't look at myself or my wonderful most extraordinary partner nimish bhai here we don't look at ourselves as creators of these these things happen absolutely zero doubt there are times and times that both of us have met and for 40 out of 
40 minutes, 45 minutes out of an hour that we might spend with each other. We are talking only about gratitude and how many coincidences have happened. And then the question arises, why did all this happen to us? There must be a reason, there must be a celestial design. And the design is that, oh, you are here to achieve certain things. I think in his own way, he's trying to do something. In my own way, I'm trying to do something. We are trying to do something together. So it is just this consciousness that we are here as a trustee of whatever has come to us, affection of people, reputation, money, some intelligence, very little part of it. The rest is all blessings. How do you put it to good use? That motivates us and we have to work 24 by 7 for that. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, Vallabh, sir. If Thank I you hurt much. you in any manner, anybody, that was not the intent. Great. Thank you. I request Dr. Viranchi Shah to come on stage. And to honor Mehul, sir, I request Deepnath Roy Chaudhary, sir, to honor Vallabh, sir.